for everyone. <laughs> when a father asked his little boy what he wanted for Christmas, the boy replied, a baby sister. As it turned out, the, the wife was pregnant and delivered on Christmas Eve. On Christmas Day, she brought home a brand new baby sister for their son. The next year, when the father asked his little boy what he wanted for Christmas, the boy said, well, if it wouldn't make mummy too uncomfortable, I'd rather like a pony. What does Christmas mean for you? I remember um, visiting a church in London, it happened to be a, a church plant of uh, Holy Trinity Brompton, uh, where the Alpha course uh, started. And I remember um, the, the vicar there, um, a friend of mine was speaking, the vicar was interviewing uh, one of the uh, congregation before he came on to speak. And she was a high school teacher, and she was sharing her heart for something that she wanted to do in readiness for Christmas that year. As being a high school teacher, she had been in, uh, engaged in teaching a, I think it might have been an RE lesson or something like that, uh, um, one morning. And a couple of the students kind of had asked to kind of chat with her afterwards because they were bemused uh, rather than abused. They weren't laughing at it. They were just bemused and intrigued as to why during the lesson she had said that she would spend Christmas going to church and thinking about Jesus. But what has Jesus and church got to do with Christmas? That was their question. Now, that might sound shocking to some of us who have grown up and perhaps have been Christians for many years. Well, what's, what's Christmas got to do with Jesus and church? An awful lot. For this group of young people, they just didn't see the connection. And so this particular member of the congregation was seeking to try and do some kind of big Christmas production that had the gospel message very much at its heart. But I share that to kind of emphasize just how much perhaps within society, that connection between Jesus being the reason for the season just isn't there, that the, the connection isn't there. As the well-known evangelist J. John says, if you take Christ out of Christmas, all you have left is MS which actually, when you think about it, when you do remove Jesus and the message of, the, of, of Christmas out of uh, what Christmas is all about, you are left with shopping and good food, particularly in Emma's case, it seems to be the only thing that keeps it going at the moment. So shopping and good food really is all that you've got left. And so this morning, I, I'm sure I'm talking amongst friends and those who, who get what the reason for the season is all about, but that's perhaps even more of an encouragement to us to begin to uh, look at the Christmas story again as we enter into Advent. It doesn't seem possible, in my think anyway, it doesn't seem possible that it's a year on since we were all on Zoom, Rod was lighting his Advent crown in his room and we were each of the Advent Sundays seeing the number of, of, of lit candles increase. That doesn't seem a year ago, but time flies when you're having fun or COVID fun. Um, but it's a, it's a year on. And so we could come again to Advent thinking, yes, we know the story. But I'd encourage us all to come with kind of fresh eyes this morning, as if this were the first time we were encountering the Christmas story and open ourselves to up to God speaking to us afresh and in a new way about what the Christmas story is all about. So this morning marks the first Advent Sunday, the first Sunday of Advent. Many of us may well have come across the term Advent. We have Advent crowns, as I was talking about, Advent calendars. But actually the um, Advent season is observed in many traditional churches as a, as a time of expectant waiting and preparation for the celebration of the nativity of Jesus at Christmas. Now the term Advent, my computer's decided to go to sleep again. There you go, should appear anyway. The, the term Advent is anglicized. It's an anglicized version of the Latin word Adventus, which effectively means coming or arrival. Um, and we could say it's all about observing the arrival of the king. And so this morning I want to entitle what I want to say about preparing the way of the king, recognizing the king is near. And we're going to base what I want to look at this morning in Luke's account of the gospel. And so um, let's turn, if you've got a Bible with you, turn to Luke chapter 1, and we're going to read from verses 1 through to 25. So Luke chapter 1, 
1 to 25. If you have a Bible, you could read along with me. Otherwise, please just do listen as I read these verses to us. So Luke chapter 1, verses 1 through to 25. Many have undertaken to draw up an account of the things that have been fulfilled amongst us, just as they were handed down to us by those who from the first were eyewitnesses and servants of the word. With this in mind, since I myself have carefully investigated everything from the beginning, I too, this is Luke writing, I too decided to write an orderly account for you, most excellent philosophers, so that you may know the certainty of the things you have been taught. In the time of Herod, king of Judea, there was a priest named Zechariah who belonged to the priestly division of Abjah. His wife, Elizabeth, was also a descendant of Aaron. Both of them were righteous in the sight of God, observing all the Lord's commands and decrees blamelessly. But they were childless, because Elizabeth was not able to conceive, and they were both very old. Once, when Zechariah's division was on duty and he was serving as priest before God, he was chosen by lot, according to the custom of the priesthood, to go into the temple of the Lord and burn incense. And when the time for the burning of incense came, all the assembled worshippers were praying outside. Then an angel of the Lord appeared to him, standing at the right side of the altar of incense. When Zechariah saw him, he was startled and was gripped with fear. But the angel said to him, do not be afraid, Zechariah. Your prayer has been heard. Your wife, Elizabeth, will bear a son, and you are to call him John. He will be a joy and delight to you, and many will rejoice because of his birth. For he will be great in the sight of the Lord. He is never to take wine or other fermented drink, and he will be filled with the Holy Spirit even before he is born. He will bring back many of the people of Israel to the Lord their God. And he will go on before the Lord in the spirit and power of Elijah to turn the hearts of the parents to their children and the disobedient to the wisdom of the righteous, to make ready a people prepared for the Lord. Zechariah asked the angel, how can I be sure of this? I am an old, an old man and my wife is well along in years. The angel said to him, I am Gabriel. I stand in the presence of God, and I have been sent to speak to you to tell you this good news. And now you will be silent and not able to speak until the day this happens, because you did not believe my words, which will come true at their appointed time. Meanwhile, the people were waiting for Zechariah and wondering why he'd stayed so long in the temple. When he came out, he could not speak to them. They realized he'd seen a vision in the temple. For he kept making signs to them, but remained unable to speak. When his time of service was complete, he returned home. And after his wife, Elizabeth became pregnant and for five months remained in seclusion. The Lord has done this for me, she said. In these days, he's shown his favor and taken away my disgrace among the people. I wonder if my Mac will continue to stay on this morning. I wonder if anyone has ever met the Queen or who's received an OBE, I'm not aware of anyone having an OBE or MBE, uh, perhaps you might have attended an investiture at Buckingham Palace or perhaps met the Queen on a royal walkabout or during a visit perhaps. The closest I've got to seeing the Queen is when I was working in Parliament and attended one of the state openings of Parliament and had a seat in the Royal Gallery, and the Queen kind of glided past in front of me. I don't know if you can see my cursor there. It doesn't read well. For those on, uh, in, on site at the moment, I'm going to use my green little laser pen. I was about there, so I was fairly close as the Queen, not on this particular occasion where this photograph's taken, but in a similar scenario. I was, I was that close. It wasn't particularly close, but it was better than not having ever seen her at all. And the actual plan for the, the morning was quite detailed. We had this detailed briefing before uh, we had to attend. And we can, you can actually see in this next one, if I can zoom in, that we actually had to be seated by 10.30. The doors are closed to the public. So we had to get in and take our seats by 10.30, which meant arriving just before 10 o'clock. All of these preparations took place to help build up to the main event, which if I move to the next, 
section here, you may still be able to see actually the Queen arriving at half past 11. So a good hour, hour and a half before the Queen, the main event actually arrived and actually took place, we had to be ready and in our seats. There was a, a big build up, in other words, and preparation in advance for the Queen's arrival. And at points we did wonder whether she would actually arrive. There were all these different, um, we can go back to my photo there, all these different uh, guards of honour that kind of marched in and processed, took their positions, followed by another set of important people. There was lots of build up um, before the actual arrival of the Queen. And in many respects, this illustrates in some form what we read of here in Luke's account. The account of Zachariah and Elizabeth forms part of the big story, the big build up to the arrival of the king, the birth of Jesus. And we need to be prepared for this arrival in much the same way as preparations had to take place for the arrival of the queen at the state opening of parliament. In summary, what were kind of the key points to what we've just read from Luke's account? Well, the key points I think are, are these. Here we have a couple well beyond childbearing years receiving news that they are going to have a child in a culture where being childless was a source of much mockery. And so into the, you have to really kind of take a, a step back or hit pause and really consider that in a culture where really Child, childlessness was really looked at as being a, a, almost a result of sin, as being something that has been brought about by something that you have or haven't done. Here they are having the news that they're going to have a child at, at a time when they would be saying in the ordinary, in the natural, just something that we would not be considering taking, uh, taking steps to, to see come to pass. Despite their disbelief, the announcement is made by Gabriel, that the son and the cup that the couple will have will dramatically advance God's plan of someone sending one to prepare Israel for the coming divine visitation. And the scriptures had foretold that the prophet Elijah would return one day to get the people ready for God's arrival. And it's this that Gabriel links and says, actually, Zechariah, that will be your son's job. John will fulfill what Elijah the prophet had spoken of. And Luke hints that this is not a strange new thing that, that it takes place just as another part of you know, just randomly. This is all part of God's carefully planned purpose. The child will be called John and play a key role in God's fulfillment of his promises. And this story, this part of the story is, that we're looking at this morning prepares us. It almost sets us up like the pageantry of the state opening of parliament for the central event and for the remarkable events which will follow, uh, as we all know and will be familiar with, the birth of Jesus Christ. So how does this speak to us today? Well, I think the account of Zachariah and Elizabeth helps to prepare for the even more remarkable conception and birth of Jesus, but reminds us of an even important truth, and that is that God regularly works through ordinary people doing what they normally do, who with a mixture of half faith and devotion, make themselves available to God to do what he wants to do through them. It goes beyond just the story of Elizabeth being free from the scorn of other mothers at, at being barren or Zachariah's delight at having a son. It points to something bigger, it points to something bigger of the God of lavish, self-giving love who is attentive to everyone, when God acts on that large scale, he takes care of the small scale as well. As others have said before me, when we give our ordinary and add it to God's extra, extraordinary things can happen. Extraordinary can be defined as the very unusual or uh, remarkable, the very different from what is normal or ordinary, and in the case of a meeting, an extraordinary meeting, is a specially convened, uh, a, a bit above ordinary meeting. Extraordinary, therefore, speaking of something unusual, remarkable, out of the ordinary taking place. 
And this passage of scripture from Luke and the account of Zechariah and Elizabeth speaks, I believe, of four markers that help us to remember and to recognize that the king is near. And I just want to share those four with you this morning. So number one is extraordinary blessing. Extraordinary blessing. Put simply, Zachariah and Elizabeth weren't expecting any of what takes place in these verses. You, you're almost getting it, you could almost say that they probably were, had retirement in mind. Childbearing is way beyond that was a hope that perhaps we'd really hoped that would happen, but didn't work out for us. We're not quite sure why. Let's just focus on doing what we're doing and prepare for later life. Childbearing was certainly not on the agenda. They weren't expecting any of what we now read in Luke's account of, uh, of, of childbearing at this time. They were a faithful couple, devout, committed to their faith. We read in verse 6 that they were righteous in God's sight. And yet, despite all of this, they had suffered the disappointment of barrenness, a condition that Elizabeth later refers to as a disgrace in verses 25. In Jewish culture, being faithful and fruitful and having children was considered to be a sign of God's favor. So simply having no children was interpreted as being a sign of God's displeasure. And so Elizabeth's feelings were probably perfectly understandable. You know, the pain, the scorn that she probably was experiencing, not only that that was perhaps spoken explicitly, but also perhaps the uh, implicit things that were happening. You now, we were, as a couple, they were faithfully serving God, but probably also thinking, well, what are people thinking and saying behind our backs? You know, we're so devoted and committed to God. Why hasn't that worked for us? And what's going on behind almost closed doors? What hidden sin might we be covering up uh, that has brought about this God's displeasure towards us that we're unable to have children? But often in scripture, when God allows a woman to be barren, he often has something very special for her in mind. And we discover here in the story of Zachariah and Elizabeth that times and pain can often give rise to times of blessing. And the extraordinary provision of God can be demonstrated. And so I don't know everyone's situation here this morning, but you may be going through a particularly tough time at the moment. Don't despair and don't give up. Because God's provision, God's blessing may just be around the corner. Somebody once wrote, a bend in the road is not the end of the road, unless you fail to make the turn. A bend in the road is not the end of the road, unless you fail to make the turn. Stick with God and make the turn. So extraordinary blessing. Secondly, extraordinary promise keeping. Like all priests at the time, with the exception of the high priest or the chief priest who would live in Jerusalem, Zechariah would have traveled in to the city from the countryside where he lived and with Elizabeth in order to perform his temple duties and to perform the liturgy. So Zechariah would have, lived, have stayed in lodgings within the temple precinct and then return home to continue his normal work as a teacher and a respected leader in the local community. Now we read in this passage in verse 9 that his lot had fallen to go into the inner court, out of sight of the people, to offer up incense to God. Now this was a great privilege, but and I really want to kind of unpack and tease out what this would actually mean. It wasn't a case that uh, Zachariah was in kind of modern understanding, modern parlance. You know, Zachariah's name was on the rota, and his name had come up on the rota to go into the inner court to perform his duties. He, it was something much more than that. He would have had duties, and if they probably had voters at that time, so Zachariah was probably on the rota for the, the duties within the temple. But going actually into the inner place, the, the inner uh, court to offer up instance was a really a privileged opportunity. This was a, a once in a lifetime opportunity. Zechariah could have died as a priest and never been called up or to have his lot fallen to go into the inner court to offer up incense. 
as one of approximately, commentators say, 18,000 priests. So as one of those 18,000, Zechariah serves in the temple twice a year, but only once in his life does he get the opportunity to assist in that daily offering by going in to the holy place. The point that I'm stressing here, this was more than just his voted responsibilities in the temple. This was a once in a lifetime opportunity. This does not happen to everyone, is what I'm saying. It doesn't happen to everyone. He, Zechariah, is called up to go into the inner place. As Zechariah embarks upon this duty, he encounters the angel Gabriel, and the news that Gabriel delivers affects Zechariah's prayer. Is being a uh, prayer in as much as that it's been answered. That, ch- that prayer that has been offered up so many times by him and Elizabeth, oh Lord, we pray for a child. That prayer is going to be answered. But since it, Zachariah had almost given up believing that God would give him a child, his prayer has probably also shifted more in recent months, recent years, of praying for the nation's hope. Well, Lord, we've been praying for a child and we've not really seen it come to pass. So the, their focus begins to shift towards praying for the nation. Oh, Lord, pray for a savior, a messiah, to bring back, turn the hearts of the people back to you, bring the people of Israel back to their Lord, their first love, the Lord, their God. That's where their prayers have begun to shift. And so we see actually what takes place is that Gabriel comes in and says, God's actually heard both of your prayers, not only on the personal level, but also on the national level, Zechariah. We're get, he's going to release and he's going to give you a son. And that in itself is going to help answer the national prayer that's been on your heart to see the nation turn back to God. God, in a sense, is tackling two requests at once, one national and the other personal. A prayer that had long since been abandoned and almost forgotten by Zechariah is actually going to be answered and be remembered. And so we need to remember, sometimes God answers, God's answers to prayer come in surprising ways after a long time. Sometimes God's answers to prayer come in surprising ways after a long time. Over to you, a bit of audience congregational participation. What I'd like you to do is just turn into small groups for about five minutes, two or three people, and just ask, answer this question. Can you share a time when God answered your prayer in a surprising way, or in a way you weren't expecting? Okay, so just turn into groups two or three with people alongside you and just share the five minutes on an occasion where God has answered a prayer for you in a surprising or an unexpected way. Anyone here in this group uh, got anything? I don't have much. No, I'm sorry. <laughs> Anybody else? Um, well, I think I think the thing that probably pops to my mind is when we um, when we bought this house. It was probably um, a lot bigger project than we imagined taking on, um, and yet and yet everything just kind of fell into place for us, and uh, and we managed. And it just feels like it, it was very much where God wanted us to be um, at the time. Well, and now, <laughs> still now. But yeah, I think when we were looking for a house, we probably um, 
Well, we, we haven't even entertained being in Holbrook or this area where we are. We were we were based in Manningtree and we we're looking for something in the Manningtree area and we had a house all lined up. We'd sold our house and that the one we were going to move to in Ardley near Manningtree all because I was working in Colchester at the time, so it just made sense to be down that way. And that, that all fell through and we had to find something really quickly um, to not lose the chain that we'd taken so long to put together as it is. And, mm -hmm. and yeah, this one came up and it was a dreadful project, um, but it was, a real, it was a real potential bargain. And we just prayed and said, well, God, if you're, we're going to put an offer in, if that offer's accepted, then we'll, we'll take that as your, uh, <laughs> your, your thumbs up. Uh, and sure enough, it was. Um, and yeah, there's so many, so many little things that came to place it. I mean, it's the, it's the village with the school where Sarah's mum went to school. Um, Sarah's aunt lives not far away, and she's on her own and needs help and support. And we're in the area now to be able to do that as it's worked out. Um, the people we bought from are a Mormon family, but we've we've ended up. Sort of uh, friends with uh, friends with uh, with them, and they're now part of the Church of England church here now in Holbrook. Um, um, and then, yeah, so many connections through the school, and so many uh, um, so many ways in which it quickly felt sort of right to be here. So, and then it, because it was a it was a total revamp project, um, we even had there was some Christian. Friends of ours who had a flat in a nearby village we could rent for just the perfect as long as we wanted while we did it up for a really good value. So it, everything sort of just fell into place somehow in in a way that was totally not what we'd expected it to be. So it just felt like God was looking after us. I think yeah. at the time. Have you got any, Gemma? Spring to mind. <clears throat> yeah, um, mine is uh, <laughs> similar in some ways to um, what Matt's just talked about, because mine is with um, with childbirth with the two, um, es Esther and Esme, uh, two youngest. Um, I'm very conscious that my battery's about to go out. Uh, but yeah, after much, much prayer um, from people in the church and um, after seven years really of prayer, um, we conceived with Esther and we just assumed she would be our um, only daughter together. And uh, lo and behold, two years later, Esme arrived as well, uh, making me one of the oldest mums <laughs> in Suffolk. Not, not compared to biblical times, obviously, but... Um, yeah, and it was true, you know, it was through prayer, a very special occasion yeah, yeah. for prayer. Mm. Um, Together, um, don't necessarily need you to move your chair, you feel a greater degree of warmth by being closer to people than to stay like that. Um, but at least in terms of, of focus, we'll come back as uh, a one big group uh, for the closing part of my talk this morning. Thank you. <laughs> it's very and cold sometimes here. Sometimes God answers, God, uh, God's answers to prayer come in surprising ways after what we consider, and I'm sure uh, I've heard some of the things that have been said uh, this morning from various groups. I'm sure we've all got some experience of that. And so when we look at Zachariah's response, his response is understandably human. He doesn't accept this message that Gabriel brings. You're going to have a son. He just doesn't accept it. This is a prayer that I prayed, Lord. Yes, but time has moved on. We're just not up for raising children and bearing children together now. We're, we're past it. You must have it wrong. He doesn't take the miraculous as a matter of course. He has a natural objection to the promise that they, he and Elizabeth will bear a child because of their old age. Zachariah is focused on the basics of biology and aging, kind of the earthly perspective. He and his wife are past their prime. God, you've got it wrong. And in response to this, the angel Gabriel 
announces his name, I am Gabriel, and indicates that God will bring his promise to pass. Angel Gabriel actually giving his name and position communicates something of the significance, the weightiness, the importance to the message that he brings as being accepted and should and his message um, commanding authority and respect and almost an indication that it is to be accepted because it is coming from the throne room of heaven. Zachariah, uh, righteous and devoted and committed as he is, needs to learn that God will fulfill his promises when he sovereignly chooses to act. The God of heaven may even do things out of the ordinary that don't fit in with our timescales or our, our way of thinking. In, ordinary, in, in other words, extraordinary things. God will do what he promises in his own way. And connected to that, facts cannot change the truth, but the truth can change the facts. The facts of the matter were Zachariah and Elizabeth were past the age of having children. That was a fact. That was, you know, that, there's nothing to dispute that. Biologically, they were past the age of having children. Therefore, the truth is, we're not going to have children. But God's truth is that God is good. He's the God of the extraordinary and the impossible. And therefore, Zachariah you are going to have a child, and the facts are Elizabeth bears a son. So the facts cannot change the truth. Sometimes people say, you know, I'm ill, I feel as if I've got a bad cold, I haven't got a cold, I haven't got a cold, I haven't got a cold, and almost believe by kind of confessing something that is completely contrary to the facts, it will somehow heal them. No, we need to recognize the facts but also hold to God's truth. Actually, by his stripes, we are healed, and we can pray for the manifestation of that truth without ignoring or almost ruling out and dis, um, uh, what's the word? discrediting the facts. Facts cannot change the truth, but the truth can change the facts. What's more, the crowd outside the temple have become nervous because of the length of time Zachariah is, is uh, spending in the inner place. His delay in some way is uh, interpreted as being something is up, something out of the ordinary is taking place, is slowing down the ceremonial process. According to Jewish tradition, the high priest was to recite a short prayer when he was in the Holy of Holies because it was assumed that God's holiness would make it difficult for him to stay in the presence for very long. So the very fact that Zechariah is spending longer in there something's up. There's, there's concern. Why is Zachariah taking so long? And we re read in Luke's account, they were all, almost marveling at how long he was taking. Their faith levels and expectancy as to what was happening were probably rising more than Zachariah's. Zachariah's getting the download. He's going to become a father and perhaps trying to wrestle with the shock and the awe and the wonder of that. But outside the crowd are thinking, how long is he staying in there? There must be something really special taking place. And when Zachariah emerges, he's unable to give the benediction, which probably was what we now know and recognize as the anironic blessing of uh, the Lord bless you, the Lord keep you, may, Lord, may the Lord make his face shine upon you and give you peace. Um, but he was unable to do that. He comes out only able to use sign language because he couldn't speak, almost indicating, you know, don't rely on me just to pronounce a blessing for you now. Expect the Messiah who can command the blessing, who is now going to be coming to earth. So he signs, has to sign a message. And the people conclude from this that Zechariah has really experienced something extraordinary, a very direct encounter with heaven, a vision. And so today we need to remember God will do what he promises in his own way. Thirdly, extraordinary empowering. We read in the account in, in verse 15 that John will be empowered, filled by the Holy Spirit, even from birth, in, even in his mother's womb. So let's not miss the fact that the Holy Spirit abiding with John represents an intensification of the Holy Spirit's presence significantly 
marking significantly something different from what we had read previously in the other Old Testament prophets. Contrast John being empowered with the Holy Spirit from the very beginning of his life in his mother's womb with these few examples that I'm going to share now of the Old Testament prophets. First Samuel 10 verse 10 says, when they came to the hill, there was a group of prophets to meet him. And then the spirit of, the, of God came upon him and he prophesied. Isaiah 61 verse 1 talks about the spirit of the Lord being upon me, upon, upon Isaiah. And Ezekiel 11 verse 5 says, then the spirit of the Lord fell upon me and said to me, speak. These events, these examples I'm showing, these where previously the spirit came upon people, John, it's being said, is being filled and empowered by the Holy Spirit from the very word go. Something new, in other words, is approaching. It's a new era. We stand on the edge of something new. It's an extraordinary empowering. John is going to be filled from the outset with the Holy Spirit. So today, let's be thankful for the fact that not only that we can be filled with the Holy Spirit and not just have the Holy Spirit come upon us, we can be filled, but thankful for the past and what's gone before, as well as being expectant for the future, open to receive, hear, and see the new things God is doing amongst us. Fourthly, extraordinary timekeeping. Extraordinary timekeeping. Having read that Zechariah returns home in verse 24, the next verse we read that Elizabeth concedes. There's no fanfare, just a simple declaration that what the angel had promised in verses 13 to 17 comes to pass. She prays God for what he was doing through her. Her disgrace, the reproach of barrenness, was gone. Such thankfulness for the arrival of a child was common in biblical times, uh, the joy and relief being mixed together in Elizabeth and Elizabeth in, in, in Elizabeth's expression of delight, and she prepares herself for what lies ahead. God is once again powerfully at work in the life of Israel and the people of that time, and in this righteous couple's life, who are learning and learning anew what it is to trust God. When God speaks and acts. People are supposed to listen because his word will come to pass. But God's promises are often time specific or time locked and time sensitive. Promises and plans for our lives are time locked and time sensitive. A time locked safe is based on a type of locking mechanism commonly found in bank vaults and other high security containers. And I've got a few examples on screen. The, the time lock is a timer designed to prevent the opening of the safe or vault until it reaches a preset time, even if the combinations are, are known and are correct. Zachariah and Elizabeth could have easily argued, we're doing all the right stuff. We have the right combinations. We're honoring God. We're following him. We're doing all the right things, Lord. Why hasn't the promises that we believe you've called us to, uh, the birth of a child and, and all of that, why hasn't it come about? They, would, they could easily have argued, we've got the right combinations. It was just a simple case of timing seemed to be out. But God had the time in hand. We need to recognize that in our own lives. and We need to realize the importance of waiting on God's timing. If we wait, we'll avoid almost ripping the thing out and trying to make it happen in our own strength outside of God's timing. We think we might have all the combinations sorted out, but actually the timing is in God's hands. As I said earlier, we need to give our ordinary, add it to God's extra, and extraordinary things happen. And when we've begun to think about this this morning, recognize as we start this process, this season of Advent this year, recognizing the King is near, we identify these markers for us to seek this. Extraordinary blessing, extraordinary promise keeping, 
extraordinary empowerment and extraordinary timekeeping. Hallmarks, markers that the fact, or the fact that the king is near. As I was thinking uh, of how to end and what God wanted to say, I believe, through what I've shared this morning, but what we wanted to say in response was this whole thing about promises over our lives and in our lives. And I was reminded of the um, old traditional promise box that some of us might be familiar with. It used to be a box where packed full of, of uh, slips of paper with uh, promises from the Bible in, and you'd take one out as a, as a form of encouragement to uh, be uh, spurred on and uh, to have your faith stirred, because this was a, literally a promise, a verse from Scripture that you could take as, as a promise to hold on to and be encouraged by. In these COVID days, I wasn't quite sure whether having a box that we all kind of touch and, and pull something out from was particularly a good idea. So I've adapted it. And I'm going to ask Debbie shortly to just come around. I've just got a, a bowl and I've hold a hold and load of number of different uh, passages of scripture that I've then printed off and put in a separate envelope. And what I just encourage you to do is just to take an envelope and take and, and take it and open it. And you'll find a promise there from God's word for you today. And it's all going to be good because it's got from God's word. But I know God well enough, uh, seen him at work long enough to know that actually in certain situations, I'm believing there's going to be a real promise for you there that is really specific, that you're going to look at it and think, how could I have ever, how could this have been orchestrated? That's so specific for my situation. I, I believe that can happen. But for all of us, I believe that these promises can be a real source of encouragement to us. We've been taught, taught, thinking about Zachariah and Elizabeth kind of wrestling and then suddenly seeing a fulfillment of their promise that they've been holding on to for so long actually come about. Let's be encouraged this morning by taking hold of God's word that's full of promises and being strengthened and encouraged in our walk with God this morning. So, Dave, would you like to just pass this ball around? Take a, an envelope. There's going to be plenty there. I've got more than enough. And just take this promise and take a few moments to read it and be encouraged. Phil, I wonder if you could take one for yourself, but also a, a, a correct number for everyone online. That's great. Thanks, Phil. So the Zoomers are, are part of it. Probably what I'm going to do is I'll, I'll pray for us. And um, then Phil, I'll give you some time to, to basically read one out for everyone that's on, on Zoom. But hopefully inside, you'll, well, you'll find a passage of scripture there that I, I pray would be encouragement to you, something that you can take forward into this week. And it may, as I say, be particularly relevant for your situation. As you just read that, I'll close in prayer and then we'll, we'll sing a song using a YouTube clip. But Father, I thank you that you are a promise-keeping, promise-making God. At this time of Advent, Father, we pray as we reflect on the coming of the King. Lord, I pray that you would give us all fresh um, eyes, as it were, to reflect on and to read the Christmas story with a fresh expectancy, a fresh um, realization of the truth that it holds for us today. I pray the Lord that we wouldn't become so familiar with it and so familiar with the trappings of Christmas that we miss the wonder, the extraordinariness of all that the Christmas story speaks to us and shouts at us almost in all the intricate details that make up that account. It's more than a story, there's a count that's taking place. Father, I pray as we look and reflect on your word, on these short 
verses of scripture that I've shared with everyone here and on Zoom. Lord, I pray that these words would be a source of encouragement. Lord, it's all from your word and your word brings life and it's a light to our paths. I pray just having these particular verses, which whatever has appeared on that slip of paper for everyone here and on Zoom, Lord, I pray they would be a real source of encouragement in the days and weeks ahead. Just having your truth stirred afresh in us, rather like Zachariah and the message from Gabriel stirred afresh what God wanted to do in and through the life of Zachariah and Elizabeth. May these words bring a sense of a fresh impetus, a fresh encouragement, a fresh stirring of what you want to do through each of our lives. I pray, Lord, that your word really would be awakened and quickened in us this Christmas time. We pray these things in your name. Amen. Let's stand and sing uh, this great song, uh, Hillsong track, which speaks and reminds us of the, the truth and the promises that are linked to the arrival and the reign of the King of Kings. And I'm not forgotten, Phil. Once we've done the song, perhaps you've got a chance to update and give one of those passages to each of those people on, on Zoom. Zoomers, I, I hope that works. It's, I've been trying to work out the best way of allowing you to, to participate. So you have a promise, and Phil will share that with you after the song. <laughs>